I... How do I say this? I didn't hate it. There are parts of it that are quite good. It's overall fairly entertaining, but... Uh, the Amazing Spider-Man 2 is... Meh. Parts of it hurt. Parts of it were fairly well done. Uh, is it worth seeing? Don't pay full price. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, possibly give some spoilers after the Dark Matter intro, but for now, very average. 5 out of 10, let's say. Cue the music. I'm like, glad I saw it. Yeah, I guess. It didn't wow me, obviously, but it was it was a night out. I had fun. Wish I had more fun. It certainly wasn't Captain America. That the, the Winter Soldier. That's excellent. If you haven't seen that, go see that before you see this one. Tr trust me, you'll have much a much much better time. Andrew Garfield, Emma Stone. They're apparently dating in real life. I think it comes across on screen. They've got pretty good chemistry. Scenes with them in them were, for the most part, very good. A few cliches sneak in here and there, but one thing that kind of bugged me is that they were very lovey-dovey. I mean, she's giving the valedictorian speech at her high school graduation. Peter comes in and gives her a great big kiss on stage. And then later on, he's supposed to join them for dinner, and he kind of gets cold feet due to the promise that he made to her father, but you were just lovely, lovey-dovey over, over her before, now you're suddenly getting cold. I, I think they try to explain that, okay, this isn't the first time he's done this, and now she's getting a little fed up with it, but it, it seemed a little forced. But after that, it gets into the, okay, they actually say this line in the movie, it's complicated part of the relationship, and that, that actually works fairly well. I've got no major complaints about that part of the film. Where Andrew Garfield and Dane DeHaan, who plays Harry Osborn, when they interact, it actually feels fairly natural too, not forced at all. Even whether uh, Garfield is Spider-Man or whether he's Peter, the, the interaction that seems natural to a point. I'll get to that. The only real complaint I have about them is that when the two of them are talking together, they, and you might know what I'm talking about here, there's a certain affectation that movie producers tend to give teenagers in movies, and they play this up big time to the point where it's rather difficult to understand what the two of them are saying from time to time. They're not enunciating very well, is what I'm getting at. It kind of slurs together a little bit, and I can't really do it without making it sound really bad, so I'm not going to even try. I'm just going to speak normally. Heck, for all I know, maybe some of you think that I do that, so... Whatever. Didn't bother me. Pretty good story. Peter exploring his father's history. Also fairly well done. So, where do the, my problems with the movie start? <sighs> with the cliched, cartoonish, over-the-top villains. <laughs> That's where it starts. To the point where, like, why did you even bother making this live action when all your villains are going to be cut out of a cartoon? Uh, in fact, that might even be insulting some cartoons which actually have more multi-dimensional villains. Oh, boy. Right at, the, right at the beginning, there's a scene where some criminals have stolen some plutonium which will apparently explode. Weird, I kind of thought you had to get plutonium into a chain fission reaction in order for it to actually explode, but if you're just carry, carrying it around, it's going to be mostly stable, unless for some reason you're carrying around a fissionable core, which would be fucking insane. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The villains in that opening scene are, well, it's Paul Giamatti, but holy Crap. Ugh, talk about your, I'm gonna beat you up, and you're not gonna stop me. I, I'm not even really paraphrasing there. That's how he sounds. It's like, 
just take the stereotype of the villain and put him in there? What? He's driving a truck. Spidey knocks on his window and carries on a conversation with the guy. The police are chasing you. Why don't you, you know, web up his hands and bring the vehicle to a stop? So that uh, the police don't have to chase this guy anymore. Instead, you're trying to joke around with the guy while he's driving away from the police. Are, what, are you stupid? Okay, the action scenes are well shot in this film. I'll give I'll give it that. Uh, some of the scenes, especially with Electro, really look like a cartoon. You know how Jamie Foxx's character Max is the nerdy scientist geek type when he's first introduced. He's got this massive, obvious comb-over, gap teeth, which are clearly too large, and it's cl quite clearly he's wearing some kind of appliance, and lisping, and just gushing over Spider-Man when he saves his life, and like, oh boy, I don't go to a live-action film to watch cliches like this, that it could be in a cartoon! Now, they do have a nice scene where he's kind of being mildly bullied by another guy, and he imagines taking this guy and just choking him out. That scene's actually a nice contrast, but uh, it just kind of comes out of nowhere, really. I guess a lot of people would probably think like that, but I didn't really think it worked that well. And then when he becomes Electro... Oh, boy, is it... Electro's Dr. Manhattan. There. He's Dr. Manhattan. He can dematerialize and bring himself back together. He's Dr. Manhattan. It's pretty much the same effect. I, uh, I almost kind of wonder if they got the same effects department to work on it. Uh, what else do I have to say? He's, he's Dr. Manhattan, but far more the cliché bad guy. I'm going to kill Spider-Man. Oh, and when, when Spider-Man first captures him, they send him to... Uh, I can't remember the name of the facility. Even the doctor who's examining him, obviously for the obvious evil doctor... Guess what nationality is? Did you say German? Yeah, you said German. Yeah, yeah, you're right. How did you know? Oh, for fuck's sake. Do you have any original ideas? Could you just... It, no, even just play it straight. Why do you have to make a cartoon out of everything? Especially since, again, we're watching a live-action film. And then, uh, Harry. Apparently, Nor Norman Osborn dies fairly close to the beginning. Harry Osborn comes in, inherits his father's business, Oscorp. And, uh, Harry apparently has the same affliction because it's some kind of retroviral infection that gets passed on to the son. And that's why... Norman started the all these experiments in order to try to cure himself. And now, okay, maybe his son can do something with it. But when he becomes the Green Goblin, and I don't think I'm spoiling much by saying that, the Green Goblin is not needed in this film. Green Goblin's only purpose in this film is so that Gwen Stacy can die. And all of this is crammed into about five minutes near the end of the film. Complete waste of a villain. Green Goblin should have had his own bloody film. Not be shoehorned into this. Way to ruin one of the key moments in Spider-Man history. Or nearly ruin. As due to the chemistry between Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone still has an impact and you still remember it, especially if you weren't expecting it, I was. Because as I said, foreshadowed, right at the beginning of the film, that she was going to die. <sighs> but to just waste the introduction of the Green Goblin, who, Green Goblin's effects are the one aspect of this film that just sucks. Uh, Green Goblin looks horrible. I don't care what you thought about the Willem Dafoe Green Goblin. I thought it looked okay. It was kind of bad that you couldn't see Willem Dafoe emote, and he had to emote with his voice, but... Oh, you had to do better than this. Again, it's a cartoon. 
it, it's he looks horrible. It it looks comical. It doesn't look like anything scary. Willem Dafoe's mask, whatever you thought of it, still had a kind of menace to it. it this no, I'm sorry, Green Goblin didn't work for me at all. Oh, and and then they bring back. Uh, Paul Giamatti's character from the beginning comes back in the rhino suit because that's what Harry Osborn wants to do to get back at Spider-Man because Spider-Man wouldn't give up his blood because to try to cure whatever the disease that Harry has that's oh so yeah not not a horrible film. I mean, I certainly liked it better than last year's Man of Steel. It's just, oh, I don't care what you think. I, man, the film sucked. <sighs> this had its moments. Not great. Not awful. Reasonably entertaining. Moves along fairly well. Some of the, A lot of the effects are actually rather cool, especially the ones involving Electro. Even though He's Dr. Manhattan. Oh, yeah, and the two planes, are, when the power goes out, it's Electro. He takes out all the power everywhere. In the meantime, why they even needed to have this in there, I don't know. It didn't add anything to the film. They just had this scene in uh, the control tower. Who, they realized, hey, wait, just before the power went out, I, I just suddenly realized these two planes are on a collision course. Why? Why, why do you need that? You don't! We already have the element of Gwen Stacy and Peter Parker fighting Electro. Why do you need to shoehorn in this other element where two planes could possibly crash into each other if they don't get the power restored in time? The power is out in New York City. I think there are going to be other problems than two planes about to crash into each other. We don't need to manufacture that in order to raise the drama. Eh... Uh... Parts that didn't have the villains were fine. The parts with the villains were over the top and goofy and cliched. If you like that in a film, you'll probably like this more than I did. Me, meh. Can't hate it. It doesn't make me want to flip tables or bash anything. It just seemed rather over the top when it didn't have to be. It could have been played a lot more straight and still would have carried the same weight, is what I'm getting at. And if they had cut Harry out, at least his transformation to the Green Goblin, and put in another film, and even have Gwen Stacy's death in that film, as opposed to the five minute. They beat Electro, and then, seriously, Green Goblin shows up, five minute fight, Gwen Stacy's dead. No! Uh, could have been a lot better. No. Oh, there is one stinger in the credits. Surprisingly, for Days of Future Past. I saw this in the theater. I thought, ooh, are, are, did Sony and Fox somehow reach an agreement that they are going to merge their universes? Uh, no. No, just some kind of agreement they came up with. I'm not sure why, but apparently maybe Mark Webb was tied up with something with Fox Studios, and but Sony wanted him for Spider-Man 2, so okay, we'll give you some free promotion for your movie and ours. That's it. No Spider-Man actually showing up in X-Men. Lame. Still like that trailer though, and I'm still going to go see Days of Future Past. But as for Amazing Spider-Man 2, uh, if you don't go see it, you didn't miss much. All right, guys, Firefly 404, Andrew signing off. <laughs>